Ok, on va pouvoir commencer, si vous le voulez bien, donc ce webinaire WebTech SCS autour de l'intelligence artificielle. SCS, effectivement, depuis avril, a souhaité faire un peu de pédagogie hein, autour de cette technologie euh, prometteuse, innovante et complexe à la fois. Donc C'est le 13e WebTech SCS, je crois, depuis avril, hein, depuis le, le confinement, où on a décidé ce format et finalement, on va le poursuivre, confinement ou pas, euh, également en 2021. Euh, L'intelligence artificielle est partout, dans nos vies quotidiennes, euh, dans, dans tous les débats aussi. Elle a un fort impact hein, sur les vies, euh, la vie quotidienne, mais aussi la vie économique. Et euh, les investissements dans les systèmes d'intelligence artificielle et les cyberattaques sur les infrastructures des entreprises, notamment, ne cessent de se multiplier ces derniers temps. Et c'est pourquoi la question de la sécurisation de l'intelligence artificielle est clé. C'est un élément clé. Et c'est ce que Shivom va nous aborder aujourd'hui avec ce thème et nous expliquer comment assurer donc la confidentialité, l'intégrité, la disponibilité des systèmes tout au long de leur cycle de vie. Donc je vais juste vous mentionner le déroulé de ce webinaire. Euh, donc, euh, Shivom, de vrai, Shivom euh, Agarval, donc, directeur général de Nextra Partners, va prendre la parole et va euh, présenter donc, euh, sa vision des choses hein, pour sécuriser les systèmes IA, une vingtaine, 20-25 minutes. Et ensuite, vous pourrez poser vos questions par écrit dans le module questions en bas du menu GoToWebinar que vous avez. Je les sélectionnerai et les mentionnerai à l'oral. Et Shivom, s'il est en capacité, pourra y, y répondre en temps réel. Je rappelle que ce webinar est enregistré et sera disponible en replay pour tous sur le site du Pôle SCS dans la session publication vidéo replay et que les présentations, sa présentation, sera disponible pour vous, membres SCS, dans l'intranet euh, du site euh, dans l'accès membres. Voilà, sans plus tarder, je te laisse la parole, euh, Shivom, je te donne la main, je mets en, en même temps les prochains événements si vous patientez un petit peu et je te donne la main. Tu m'entends, Shivam Oui. Aïe. Voilà, tu devrais avoir la main. Ouais. Donc, Nestra est un nombre actif de, de Etsy, on vient de le voir à l'écran. Ouais, ah oui, excuse-moi, euh... excuse j'ai oublié une chose très importante, très importante, excusez-moi. Euh, la, la présentation de Shivom, de Nextra Partners, sera en anglais, mais avec des mots très, très simples, donc tout à fait compréhensibles par tous. Hein, et c'est vraiment l'objectif de, ce, de cette session de sensibilisation, vous faire comprendre des, des, technologies, euh, des, oui, des technologies et des, des applications très, très complexes avec des mots simples. Et vous allez le voir, ça va être le cas avec... Euh, avec Shiva Magarbal. Voilà, je te laisse la parole. Okay, merci. Um, so today, what uh, we first need to understand uh, when we talk about uh, AI and cybersecurity is what are the major trends happening out there in the market and how they are shaping our cyber future. First thing that we realize is that um, most enterprises today I have started making data governance, data quality, exploitation as part of their strategy. We see this um, with many of our own clients, uh, whether it's Airbus, CMS, AGM, Naval Group, they are already uh, moving into more and more in this direction. On the other side, we are also saying that AI deployment is happening. It's happening today. It's happening across processes, across departments, across uh, geographies but it is not secure. Most of the thinking about security in terms of securing AI systems is still taking a back step because today when we think about an AI solution, the first thing we try to think, uh, do is uh, state of the art. We look at the algorithms. What are the latest models available out there? Can we improve uh, a bit of our um, uh, accuracy in those models or not? But like any other technology, we are following a kind of an S curve where we see that we today we are in the phase of early adoption. Then we will move into mass adoption. Then the technology will stabilize, and then we will start thinking about cybersecurity. But in case of AI, can we really wait until it becomes a mass adopted, uh, omnipresent technology to build security? The other thing that we see today is that 
AI is not only, we are not only deploying them for internal processes to gain efficiency, to find new use cases, to get new uh, social revenue, build new services, but also that it is a technology that is available to the adversaries. So today we already started seeing algorithmic cyber attacks where uh, we are classifying them as advanced persistent threat. It is the days are gone when you had a hacker sitting somewhere uh, and trying to uh, analyze um, your network traffic, do a network enumeration, and then vulnerability analysis, and then launch an exploit into your, uh, um, your network. But today, we are talking about automated algorithmic system that do all of this automatically. That also has the capability to design and launch and exploit uh, in real time, depending on what kind of security environment. And on the other side, we cannot only forget, uh, we cannot only focus on what is happening today. We also have to think what is almost about to come in the near future. And here I'm talking about quantum computing. The world of cybersecurity, AI, cannot be completely separated out from the world of quantum because they also um, are related and have a cross impact and interdependence. What we see that today there is a strong need of um, bridging systems that can bridge between the, the future of the quantum that is coming and our classic computers. On the other side, we also see that the technology of edge that started some years ago versus cloud computing that started a couple of decades ago. Now the two worlds are coming together. This world of the small and the world of the big are coming together in seamless fashion. What it is also doing on one side, it is creating tremendous amount of opportunities. We already see with some of our work on um, uh, with video camera companies like Smart TV, um, that today we need a seamless integration between edge computing and cloud computing infrastructure so that we can launch a edge computing solutions on individual IoT devices, but at the same time extract data streams from it and we'll be able to build more sophisticated um, solutions um, at an integrated level at the cloud. But we already know that IoT devices have many security vulnerabilities. We don't even have consensus on many aspects of the design of IoT devices and the protocol stacks that are needed. So when we talk about integrating them with cloud infrastructure, one of the biggest challenges that we face is cybersecurity. Especially when we are, when we, our attack surface increases by thousands and thousands of devices and uh, points of attack uh, we have to be much more careful about uh, integration between these two technologies. On the other side, um, we are already seeing that uh, open innovation and uh, external technology partnerships are also happening today. So we see open source codes becoming part of many of our uh, uh, new application developments that we are doing today. This creates its own cybersecurity challenge. And of course, uh, we see, um, as also uh, Fabian pointed out, uh, we are seeing an increase in, in number of cyber attacks. And one of the reasons uh, behind this is increase in remote work because of the sanitary conditions that we have today. So we need, um, this is creating more vulnerabilities because now the, the, the limits of the in enterprise network have stretched much beyond the enterprise itself. And the, the, the classic frameworks of PKI and AES, public infrastructure and AES encryption mechanisms that most organizations are using today, they are failing uh, to keep these cyber attacks at bay. So first thing that I want to point out is that when we talk about AI systems and AI system design, it's not just algorithms. There is something way more beyond algorithms. What you see that uh, many organizations tend to get stuck at the POC level, at the POC uh, proof of concept, and they are not able to move to a fully industrialized solution because mm, there is a huge uh, investments going on uh, from uh, consulting companies and universities and research centers on designing a better algorithm. Let's take an accuracy, uh, state of the art with an accuracy of 96%, 
in terms uh, in terms of um, the prediction and we want to increase it to 99 percent but this three percent improvement may not bring us that much economic value for a business while there are other aspects that of an ai system that brings tremendous value and this goes into the area of data governance so first uh, we look at data master data management where we talk about data lakes as well as data sources as well as data engineering which is about uh, automated data integration data cleaning optimization of how the process uh, of extraction and transformation is working and on the other side we also have to calibrate our poc models back uh, when we want to industrialize them with new data pipelines and build custom um, mechanisms to configure uh, our data lakes uh, to be calibrated with our uh, algorithm there are multiple steps involved when we talk about building an AI system. And many of these steps are now posing vulnerabilities for cyber attacks. This brings us to a um, conversation which, has, uh, which started uh, more than two years ago. Um, and it took time to formulate and structure it uh, with organizations um, like uh, Huawei, um, uh, Orange, British Telecom, Cybersecurity agencies of, uh, I think, six European countries, including uh, ANSI from France, as well as uh, European uh, cybersecurity agency ENISA. We are all, they are all members of this uh, specification group. We are, we, are, we are also full members there and have been working on building a technology standard so that tomorrow every company uh, which wants to deploy an AI system should or at least have a blueprint in front of them to secure this system the underlying rationale for this industry specification group for securing ai is that autonomous um, uh, computing entities may make decisions that act against the reliant parties either by design or by act of a malicious intent what you see is that the conventional risk analysis and countermeasures do not work completely in case of AI system. So we need a new way of thinking in this. The three scopes that we are really covering within this uh, uh, technology standard that should be coming out in, uh, in six to eight months, or probably a little bit longer, um, is securing AI from attacks, where AI is a component in the system that needs uh, defending. We also look at mitigating against AI, where AI is the problem when we are talking about polymorphic viruses or AI-based malwares, as well as using AI to enhance cybersecurity measures against attacks from other things, where we use AI as part of our cybersecurity framework. So some of the things, um, building blocks of this standard uh, that I wanted to point out is first, uh, what is this continuum of intelligence? Are we also covering robotic process automation in this? Or are we purely talking about deep learning systems where this is the continuum that relies? So we look at uh, in this continuum in terms of um, uh, definitions and ontologies, we first start with expert systems. We also look at data mining. We also look at adaptive um, uh, pattern recognition then to a certain extent semi-autonomous, then complete autonomy, and then towards a sentient system. We are still uh, far from uh, the last two, three steps. Other thing that you look at is the threat tree, that there are different kinds of threats today. Uh, we are talking about information loss, information corruption, forgery, masquerading, unauthorized access, which uh, leads to, uh, which are encompassed within the manipulation, but we also have denial of service, repudiation, and interception kind of attacks. On the other side, um, AI can be used for defense. AI can also be used for attacks. There are uh, AI components um, that need securing from attacks and vulnerabilities. And we can um, have to think about attacks and defenses to AI systems where we think about specific vulnerabilities of AI systems. So if we look at data supply chain, we talk about first data acquisition. How do we acquire data? We have to do data source qualification. We have to extract the data. Then we have to perform the ETL, extraction, transformation, loading. 
within the transformation aspects, we also do some kind of pre-processing. We do some kind of data cleaning, some kind of augmentation of the data. We try to find missing values, predict uh, some kind of mathematical inductions, etc. This is done even before we move into the machine learning uh, side, the algorithmic side of things. And every step of these are wonderful. When you move into the um, uh, machine learning uh, side of things, we are talking about other aspects which are quite vulnerable. The architecture definition itself. If we know already that you are using certain components of other technologies in your architecture, then those vulnerabilities also can affect you. Uh, we are also talking about parameterization uh, in these uh, ML models which can also lead to a lot of um, uh, different type of attacks, more specifically um, uh, data stealing of, uh, uh, um, attacks in this. And uh, some smaller aspects which uh, tend to form a core part of most uh, ML algorithms out there, which is random seeding. We need to find random numbers uh, that will form some part of randomization aspects of my algorithmic model. And this, just this random uh, sampling and random feeding can create another type, uh, aspects of vulnerabilities. And of course, output testing uh, creates some. Indeed, there are solutions out there. Um, we uh, have been thinking about cryptographic solutions for quite some time. Actually, cryptography makes uh, the basis of most of our security solutions on public internet infrastructure the way we understand it. Whether we talk about our Facebook password, why it is secured, because uh, data is encrypted. Uh, why our banking passwords are secured, our banking sessions are secured, because it's uh, encrypted, the data in, in between is encrypted. There are uh, very standard ways for ensuring integrity of data to apply cryptographic hash functions. The major steps that you involve in this kind of cryptographic hash function is first the providing party provides the data, their hash values, and the digital signature to the verifying party. And then the verifying party can check the correctness of the digital signature, which will not match if the signed values have been modified in the meantime. The logic is very simple. If the signature is valid, the verifying party applies the hash function to the data and compares the results to the signed hash function value. If it all matches, it's good. If the data is tampered, the two match, two values will not match. The classic way of using um, uh, cryptographic mechanisms. There are some more improvements coming into this, uh, more around hash trees in this, where the approach is uh, more straightforward, where you try to use hash trees for combining many individual hash values and to only digitally sign the root hash um, of, the, of the whole tree. This way, we uh, save some aspects of, um, of our bandwidth while the data is being communicated. Of course, hash trees reduces storage space and allow the verifying ver verification of the integrity of individual data points as well as the whole data set, depending on what level we want to work on. The exact structure of such hash trees should be chosen depending on the requirements uh, in terms of trade-off between storage space. So if you do not have to save the storage space and you are not working with very mass amounts of data, maybe it is not uh, very efficient to use hash trees. We can use more classic hash functions. Uh, depending on how much computation effort you need, uh, logical structure of the data, as well as mechanisms available for you to debug. Common examples of, uh, are tiger tree hash or uh, Merkle hash. Now, I want to go a bit more technical and a bit more deep into uh, different types of attacks and what kind of mitigation techniques that can exist today uh, for uh, specifically when we talk about AI systems. I'm first going to focus on poisoning attacks. So in case of poisoning attacks, uh, what we are um, looking at is that first, they, they tend to target uh, the data supply chain here. Um, where they try to uh, poison or change the incoming uh, input of the data and by virtue of the uh, corrupt input, they want to corrupt the whole system as well as the output. So in this, of course, we need uh, enhanced quality of data and we need some kind of protection uh, for our supply chain. 
and we should try to deploy some kind of quantifiable data quality measures in it but what we see is actually at the development stage that's where a lot of poisoning attacks are coming they are not coming at the source or at the extraction stage they are coming more and more at the development stage where we are actually talking about the training data sets and the ml um, uh, models under training in this one of the uh, mechanisms uh, mitigation strategies that we can use is uh, data sanitization there are already um, uh, uh, frameworks available uh, like Ronnie, Trim, PS, that uh, allow us to do data sanitization uh, before we put the data into uh, the data uh, into the training um, uh, into the training systems of the machine learning models. Second, uh, we can also think about uh, model agnostic data purifying mechanisms because most of the mechanisms like data sanitization mechanisms they are very much dependent on what kind of ML model at the end we're going to use. But there are some new uh, mechanisms uh, available out there, like uh, data trustworthiness and uh, a new um, um, algorithm that helps us in um, uh, checking the integrity and the veracity of the data called KNH KNHT. And I will be able to give uh, more details and references to Fabian if anyone wants to look in detail later on. Uh, what you see uh, in this is um, um, the, the block um, uh, um, poisoning uh, without online learning um, can happen uh, when we talk about, uh, so the specific type of poisoning attack we are looking at is block poisoning, which can happen without learning and which can, which can be mitigated uh, using uh, uh, online learning and gradient shaping. So gradient shaping is one of the interesting techniques that I am tend to use more and more in uh, in uh, learning infrastructure of the ML models, uh, which is delivering very good results uh, more and more. So when we move away from development stage to deployment stage, uh, we can think about a robust combiner, uh, for example, Ensemble, uh, which can help us uh, to um, uh, move um, our regular updates and outputs more closer into the model of operation. Other one, there are other many other types of cyber attacks. Um, uh, one of the cyber attacks that uh, we can think about is uh, backdoor attacks. In this, um, the the mechanism, the mitigation mechanisms that work well um, is uh, trigger detection. If we can figure out where the first um, the root cause of this backdoor exists, where does it come from? Uh, was there was it coming from a root kit uh, that was already installed in our systems uh, or is it coming uh, as a part of a, a large botnet uh, depending on where the the, the, the trigger is uh, we can um, uh, focus uh, our um, um, energy on mitigating it through there of course the mechanism of data sanitization are still relevant here uh, this way we can um, uh, the, the raw data is not really available for the attackers to look at there are other mechanisms for trigger detection here like spectral signatures or activation clustering uh, that is available today we can also think about pr primarily when we talk about model training we can talk about model restoration um, for example fine pruning uh, neural cleanse or tabor these are two new um, uh, mathematical models available that can help us uh, uh, to do model restoration this is the, their primary use case but i'm thinking more and more that they can also be used for um, auditing um, uh, machine learning models if we have a way uh, to restore uh, the the model that was trained uh, uh, post hoc rather than a priori then we have a way to actually audit uh, a, a model of course most deep learning models will uh, be hard to even use fine pruning, uh, but to a certain extent, uh, some convoluted neural networks work better uh, with neural cleanse or tabor. Um, deployment stage. Um, in this, what you see is a similar kind of trigger detection that we had uh, in development stage. They can also be applicable here, but we can also have more a preventive mechanism, not only a, uh, a defensive mechanism. And this can be a pure deactivation. So this is uh, a way where they can cut off uh, this kind of trigger that was starting the back door. Or we can try to close the, the door uh, in the real time. 
there are uh, some um, uh, neural network mechanisms uh, for this to to input uh, like strip uh, sentinet februrus etc while we also have some backdoor detection mechanisms um, uh, like uh, very similar e building on the model restoration idea um, but there are others like deep in inspect uh, this is um, a model uh, this is a mechanism created uh, purely for neural networks uh, to inspect if there are any backdoors inside the model which is being operated they try to capture they try to create uh, uh, different patterns uh, of uh, of the operational of the model uh, happening before and after the cyber attack and try to do some kind of a difference in difference kind uh, of uh, analysis evasion attacks this is another uh, type of attacks and we see that here we can focus on data pre-processing and transformation null labeling um, this goes also very much into some solutions uh, out there uh, on metadata. Uh, if we can work on metadata tagging, uh, some uh, and we can use uh, many of uh, blockchain algorithms out there or some other encryption algorithms, uh, so that metadata of any data set cannot be changed. This is a way of labeling the data throughout the supply chain. If we can secure the metadata uh, uh, through some kind of um, a distributed ledger, then we can see that in such a mechanism, uh, not only the data is auditable and identifiable throughout the supply chain and throughout the model processing, but also helps us in uh, having a kind of a checks, uh, uh, um, uh, checksum so that uh, we know if there are any evasion attack, if, they, if someone is trying to get into the system um, with, uh, as an unauthorized access. On the purely on the model side, we have uh, techniques like model hardening, um, where we can do adversarial training. Uh, basically, you put uh, the model into an adversarial environment where the environment tries to attack the model regularly. Regularization is uh, uh, another mechanism that we see uh, tend to work a bit decently well. Then we can move into more robustness evaluation, um, where we try to have more um, model verifi ver verification certificates. Um, this uh, you can think about uh, model verification certificate as um, as a, again a kind of a ch uh, checksum that we uh, built as a designer had this view of this model versus the model that is, is running right now. Are do the two the same? What changes have happened, etc. In case of deployment stage, uh, we are talking about a detection. Um, uh, here we are specifically talking about uh, evasion uh, attacks. Uh, if we can detect them while they are happening, there are uh, we can look at uh, uh, basic patterns um, of input reference there. We can also to think about input restoration, uh, quantization. We use a lot. Uh, this is a mechanism that came out of neural network compression um, where uh, we try to bring uh, neural networks that exist at the cloud computing uh, or server level we try to compress them and bring it to the edge uh, uh, systems and quantization is a common technique that we use in there but now this technique can also be used um, to create a security envelope uh, around um, our in, pro in operation uh, models while on the output side, again, we can do some kind of ensemble uh, restoration. Model stealing, uh, this is less common kind of an attack, but I think this will become more and more common as we go into the future and AI systems in itself have are cons start being considered as a pure asset. Because today data has been considered and is designated as an asset uh, as back as 2014 World Economic Forum already uh, assigned uh, data uh, enterprise data as an asset, but uh, algorithmic system have not gone into the same direction. Yet. So model stealing is becoming more uh, is is it's uh, it's upcoming uh, cyber attack. One of the things that we can do is IP management and watermarking. Uh, this is common uh, mechanism that we use in large scale network infrastructure in distributed computing when we want to check whether the computation in a distributed computing setting happened um, uh, in a, uh, happened in the same mechanism order that we wanted it to happen.
in deployment stage, uh, we are talking about uh, stealing detection. There are specific warning uh, uh, algorithms that are available that we can deploy alongside our operational model. Other thing that we can think about is uh, output obfuscation. Um, that uh, the, the the final outputs are always rounded off. They are not the point output, or you give them a range output rather than a point output. Um, this is a way to think about uh, obfuscation. Or fingerprinting, um, this is uh, another new technique that we are uh, seeing more and more. Uh, it goes back into the extraction warning kind of a Besides this, um, what you uh, what we see today um, more and more. Um, so I will go quickly over this. Um, um, what we see today, there are certain trends um, that are uh, happening and creating many vulnerabilities. As I already pointed out, uh, edge and cloud integration is happening. So it is creating some cybersecurity implications as well as new opportunities. What we see today, there are new architectures that are coming out. Um, for example, compressed edge twin models that, that you have the same neural network at the server level, a compressed version of the same neural network exists uh, at the edge device and only in processing data is transferred. So even if you capture the data in between of this uh, algorithmic system, this data is almost useless because there are so many mathematical functions that have already been performed. On. Of course, new standards are coming out, but also uh, what we see uh, organizations like 1M2M, which have moved more into this area and trying to bring consensus across uh, multiple domains. Uh, quantum computing, uh, it's out there. Um, yeah, what we see is that uh, companies like Google have already claimed that quantum supremacy uh, exists, uh, although the experiment was a very limited setting. Uh, we already know that we have reached the limits of Moore's law. We cannot uh, keep pushing more transistors into a smaller space. So we need more computation power out there. And what we see today, uh, that because of the rise of quantum computers, uh, many um, governments and research organizations have already started feeling the heat on this. That's why an uh, NIST, um, uh, which is a national science organization in US, uh, started uh, looking at quantum algorithms as a family and started uh, minimizing uh, to see which uh, algorithms of today will still be applicable and quantum safe in tomorrow's world. But it does not mean that we remain on only in these kind of algorithms. What we see strongly is there is a new opportunity to build new algorithms uh, that can be applied to uh, as, which can work as a bridging system. So some quantum algorithms that can be applied to classic systems. I have some examples like Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm. Uh, we have quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Uh, we have uh, Harrow Harrison Lloyd. These are different examples of such algorithms that are existing today. So I would like to um, uh, close with uh, my final um, uh, um, uh, words on the opportunities that are existing today when we talk about AI in cybersecurity. Uh, today, we are able to process millions of data points in real time to build AI-based cybersecurity solutions, not only securing AI solutions. And there are multiple startups who have already built many different kind of models in this. Some uh, really big ones to look at is like Dark Trace, which has already raised over uh, $200 million uh, in funding. Now, uh, with this, I would say thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Merci beaucoup, uh, Shivam. Uh, tu peux, uh, oui, on peut rester sur cette slide. N'hésitez pas à poser vos questions par écrit dans le module questions en bas uh, du module uh, GoToWebinar. Donc, vos questions hein, sur... Uh, l'intelligence artificielle et la cybersécurité, son utilité, l'intelligence artificielle comme source de problèmes, mais aussi comme solution. Voilà ce que j'ai retenu aussi de cette présentation. Vous pouvez vos, poser vos questions en français et Shivom ben, tentera de répondre ou en français ou en anglais, c'est au choix. Merci. Pas de questions
Vous travaillez peut-être juste euh, pendant, pendant que les questions sont posées euh, chez Yvonne. Euh, vous, Nextra Partners, vous travaillez donc euh, sur les. Enfin, you, 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 tu préfères en anglais peut-être Oui, oui. c'est ce que vous Ok. So, uh, what is the, maybe the, the role of Nextra Partners in, uh, I mean, um, uh, securing uh, the infrastructure of companies uh, yes. and, uh, AI, uh, and their AI systems? Yeah, so uh, today Nexta partners um, uh, work uh, both at the strategy level as well as the technology deployment. Uh, so we have our own uh, cyber security team, um, it's still uh, growing. Um, uh, we are uh, four people, but we are growing more and more. And we have strong collaboration with the team, uh, Sajatian and Gardan, uh, where uh, we can not only do software testing, uh, testing of our some of the cyber security solutions, but also at the hardware level. So if um, companies, um, when we work with companies, we do cybersecurity audit, then build a strategy how to do cybersecurity and then deploy it. Okay, thank you. So there is a first question in English. Thank you uh, for uh, writing it in English. So will homomorphic encryption help to avoid data manipulation before applying AI? Uh, so I, I probably know from where the question is coming from. Uh, I, I, know the, I know the company which is doing uh, homomorphic encryptions. Um, you yes, can name I, it. you can name it. You can name it. Uh, homomorphic encryptions, I think, can actually work well, um, um, and uh, they can um, help in uh, managing integrity of the of the data uh, throughout the data supply chain. Uh, the complication with homomorphic encryptions is uh, that they tend to uh, slow down, that the, the bitrate con consumption is a bit higher, uh, especially when we are talking about 10 terabytes of uh, data per second uh, moving in between two data, two data points. Um, so homomorphic encryptions can be a bit slow in that sense. Okay, thank you. Another question, how long the standardization should take? Okay. Um, so. Today, um, the standard is not completely out there. We only have a draft of it out there. Uh, the fully validated standard is not out there yet. So we are still not ready on the Etsy side. Uh, the group should, uh, we are envisioning by the end of this year, we will be able to put out a fully specified standard. Um, then we expect within the standard, we have already uh, specified that if you want to implement the standard within your organization uh, to secure AI systems, uh, it should take on an average uh, from uh, three months to six months, uh, depending on the type of system and complexity. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question. Do the classic protection systems used in IT networks, for example, MAC address filtering, have, yes. a, future, have a future in the field of artificial intelligence? Um, so this kind of access control, whether it's a Mac-based access control or IP-based access control or any other parameter of identity that we want to use to do access control, those um, systems, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, my simple, small, humble personal opinion, uh, they, they will become more and more irrelevant going forward. Uh, um, because we have other kinds of new identity verif verification mechanisms uh, that are coming into play. Um, so the classic mechanisms uh, I do not see of access control will be more relevant tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Another question. Uh, please uh, help us in uh, asking a question. Otherwise, um, uh, so we will close the webinar. And uh, as I said, you know, uh, maybe I will put, uh, waiting for another question, the next events, if you send me, uh, if you let me um, put my screen oh, on. Yes, Wazi, uh, I will give you this control back. Ah, there is another question. Okay, one moment. Mm -hmm. uh, um, is there is there a risk of BS? I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay, BS. If the data input management 
is too thorough. Um, sorry, I did, I did not understand the question. I will, so I will uh, I will copy it. I will write it to you uh, maybe in an email or or, or in the chat. In the chat, I, I, I can. In the in the chat, okay. You can send to me. You should see it now. Let's go bias if the data input management is too thorough. Um, I, I think um, this, this, is, this is an interesting uh, debate uh, out there, whether uh, we should use uh, data in a completely raw form uh, when building our AI models. Um, because we have to realize that even the raw data is biased. Uh, depends on what kind of biases we are talking about. If you're talking about gender biases, uh, I see this uh, happening in most HR data that I have worked with. They are by default gender biased. Uh, so if you take the outcome parameters as well as the input parameters directly from the same data set, most uh, um, data sets are biased by default. It takes us to a more philosophical question that when, when we want to build AI systems, we want to build AI systems to be as close to a human behavior. And we know that most of the data that we want to consume in these systems uh, will be coming by uh, human actions. And we know that most humans have biases. And because of these biases, the data is, by default is biased, whether we're talking about racial bias, gender bias, all kind of biases, and then it goes into the system. Uh, but there could be other bias of itself, uh, which is more about the data integrity problems. Um, and in my view that uh, the more uh, structured data input mechanism that you have uh, you will find that you have a lower risk of bias injury okay thank you so another question what do you think about physical digital cryptography primitives like physical and clonable functions in securing ai point Yes. Sanitizing, sorry, sorry, sanitizing and securing the data at the creation step. Yes, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, idea. Um, in, in my view, that uh, this technology is cheap, it works well, uh, and our work is in, in the standard is less about hardware, is very much about the software side. And once the data has come out. So I think this can be a very complementary mechanism to the securing AI standard that we just covered. Thank you very much. So I will show, I don't know if you can see maybe the next, the next uh, events uh, because I have no more questions. Let me check. Uh, So now just a few, uh, quelques, s'il y a des questions, uh, je ne sais pas si tu les vois, Shivom, tu peux m'en faire part. En tout cas, juste un petit uh, aperçu sur les prochains événements. Je vais uh, jouer ça en français là. Uh, donc le prochain événement, bah, c'est uh, jeudi, hein, jeudi 12 novembre matin, uh, agenda réduit en matinée 100% digital avec le, le Smart City and Territory Innovation Day. D'ailleurs, Shivom, hein, tu devrais aussi... Uh, Ouais. Euh, présenter ton use case innovant euh, autour du smart territoire euh, intégrant de l'intelligence artificielle. 17 startups vont pitcher, ça va être rythmé mais passionnant avec euh, les démarches innovation également de la métropole de Marseille, euh, la métropole de Nice, Côte d'Azur, euh, la région qui va pr présenter des, des, des exemples de projets sur des territoires, enfin, des projets exemplaires pardon, sur des territoires de la région, euh, mais également une table ronde avec le canal de Provence, avec Enedis, avec euh, le SNEG, l'opérateur de gaz et d'électricité euh, de Monaco notamment. Et puis, euh, ensuite, nous aurons le 3 décembre un atelier présentiel qui se convertit également en digital. On est un peu obligé, vu la conséquence, vu le contexte sanitaire. Atelier autour du marché du véhicule connecté, véhicule autonome. Hein. Quels sont les freins Quelles sont les barrières à l'entrée Quelles sont les opportunités sur ce marché par euh, une personne experte du, de la filière automotive, j'allais dire, qui connaît, qui connaît euh, cette filière et ce marché euh, sur les doigts de la main, euh, qui viendra donc euh, en digital le 3 décembre 
à midi, présenter donc son, partager en tout cas son savoir-faire et son expertise euh, et répondre à vos questions. Euh, la journée annuelle qui devrait se passer euh, le 15 décembre, mais je n'ai pas plus d'éléments aujourd'hui. Et puis le prochain webinar, WebTech SCS, qui aura lieu le 27 novembre autour de l'industrie du futur. Une opportunité pour les petites et moyennes, euh, petites et moyennes industries, j'allais dire, hein, entreprises industrielles de la région avec le parcours euh, sud-industrie euh, proposé par la région, mais également une, une, une opportunité business pour les offreurs de solutions, comme Nextra par, par exemple, hein, des opportunités business pour participer à la transformation digitale de ces entreprises euh, industrielles. Et puis ensuite, euh, un autre webinaire que je suis en train de monter là sur Embedded AI, or Trusted AI, c'est-à-dire l'IA embarquée, euh, l'IA Edge, euh, l'IA euh, Computing, euh, donc l'IA très proche hein, du hardware, euh, du semi-conducteur, donc la, la, le lien, euh, la complexité de, de, de la relation entre euh, hardware mat matériel et euh, intelligence artificielle logicielle qui sera donc traité le 11 décembre à 11h. Voilà, je regarde s'il y a une autre question, mais je ne crois pas. Non, voilà, donc il n'y a pas d'autres questions, donc il ne me reste plus qu'à à vous remercier. N'hésitez pas à revenir vers, vers moi ou vers Audrey si vous voulez plus d'informations sur un, un événement que je viens de, de mentionner. Euh, Shivom, je, remercie, je te remercie vivement pour, euh, encore une fois, hein, ton, le temps disponible et ton partage de savoir-faire et d'expérience avec euh, les, les auditeurs hein, de ce webinaire. Et puis, je te donne rendez-vous bah, du coup euh, jeudi prochain matin euh, en, en format digital pour le Smart City and Territory Innovation Day. Voilà. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Fabien. Merci, merci à tous et... pour les, pour, pour la tente, ouais. pour Merci, merci à tous et bonne, euh, bonne journée, bon week-end un peu en avance. Au revoir. Au revoir.